So then today the feast of uh, St. Thomas Aquinas, so a first class feast for our seminary, of course, and the greatest common doctor of our holy church, and who we want to be the center and heart, and it must be the center and heart of our Catholic teaching and our spirit and faith in the seminary here at Lady of Mount Carmel. First of all, a couple of announcements before uh, beginning the, um, the sermon to uh, lay a couple of uh, uh, confusions. First of all, regarding the uh, Archbishop uh, Ambrose, that uh, there's some confusion that may be there. On January 23rd, 2019, a couple months ago, I uh, made an announcement. Dear friends and benefactors, the final decision on the case of Archbishop Ambrose Moran and the Lady of Mount Carmel Seminary is as follows. After a long investigation, it is concluded that while the Archbishop is a valid bishop, there are nonetheless unexplained anomalies related to his case, which have not been able to be verified as true since evidence points in multiple directions in these anomalies. Ample time has been given to clear up these anomalies, but the results are inconclusive. Proper and su sufficient ecclesiastical authentication is therefore lacking. Hence, the Archbishop cannot be used in his Episcopal powers at Our Lady of Mount Carmel Seminary. And uh, the, the following note was sent to him on uh, January the 16th, uh, 2019, last week. The Archers of Ambrose, please be advised to this date, final sufficient verification required by the Church to use your Episcopal powers for our seminary is not in our hands. You have been asked and given ample time to provide the necessary certificates with real clear authentication. You have not done so. We did all we could in our part to facilitate your obtention of all the necessary proofs. Hence, we cannot proceed with any allowance to your, of your services in the capacity of Bishop at Lady Mount Carmel Seminary in Christ Father Pfeiffer. May God bless all the investigators, both here and abroad, who worked diligently and thoroughly in this matter without bias, intimidation, or coercion, as well as all those souls who have manifested their prayers, sacrifices, and legitimate concerns in this case. May all those who have spread unfounded gossip and twisted tales be forgiven and beg forgiveness for the spreading of evil. As for myself, I am sorry for any of my failings in this matter as well. I do not wish to turn down the gifts of Our Lady or to move forward rashly, hence the slow movement forward in this case. May God bless each and every one, and may our Holy Mother Mary let us persevere in the great battle of the faith by keeping it whole, unblemished, and entire to hand down to the next generation what we have received in Christ, Father Pfeiffer, Rector Lady Mount Carmel. And this decision is final, finished in January, as, and, and as Father Hugo said in his last sermon here, uh, uh, the week after that, the, the, we, the case is uh, closed and we're moving on. And then secondly, the, uh, uh, the situation of uh, the uh, Father Poisson. Remember, Father Poisson is a valid priest, and we wouldn't put into the battlefield the priest who is not able to teach the holy faith and administer the true sacraments. And uh, Father Poisson is a valid priest, ordained in the Latin tradition rite as I was, and also as Father Hugo was, and the priest of the Society of St. Pius X, and all priests of the, the last oh, 2,000 years in the Latin rite. She was ordained in the Latin rite as I was, and then also, also ordained by a bishop who clearly had the intention to do what the church does, Bishop Tendon. And, uh, and therefore, according to the policy of the Society of St. Pius X in the days of Archbishop Lefebvre, it would not question the, the validity of his ordination. And the new ordination right, matter, and form are valid in any case following the principles of St. Thomas Aquinas. And furthermore, that uh, the, uh, uh, the case of, uh, uh, with regard to, uh, remember that um, the, um, we would persevere in the Holy Faith, and we continue the work of Christ, and that's all, the, and that's all, all the way, what we must do. In any case, if you have considerations here in the Feast of St. Thomas, in the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, amen. And also remember to please keep uh, Father Hugo in your prayers. Uh, Father Hugo has, has uh, moved on, and we pray for his uh, return, and uh, his uh, welcome back here to the Father's house, and that, uh, you know, that it, where he's been at his home for the last six years, and we very much have seven years, we very much appreciate also the work of Father Hugo over the last seven years here at Lady Mount Carmel, preaching the faith and teaching our seminarians and moving into the circuit. And we appreciate very much the work that he has done. And, uh, and so we wish uh, him well and uh, pray for the return and pray for Father Hugo and pray for us here at Lady Mount Carmel and for our seminarians in the perseverance of the faith. So 
So in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, Amen. Today, the feast of St. Thomas Aquinas. And remember, we are in a battle of the faith. But our battle of the faith is one in which it is not just a matter of words or a matter of ideas, a matter of doctrine by itself. When St. Thomas was a little baby, when he was born as a little bitty baby, he saw the Ave Maria, the Hail Mary, written on a piece of paper. And he was just a little infant. And he took it and held it in his hands. And he wouldn't let go of it. He held that Ave Maria in his hands. He held it in his hands. He wouldn't let go of it. And uh, his when wet nurse tried to take it away. And finally his mother ripped it out of his hands. And he wept and wept and reached for it and reached for it. Finally his mother gave it back to him and he ate it. it was the first act of St. Thomas Aquinas to eat the Hail Mary. At the end of his days, when he was 49 years old just before he died, our Lord Jesus Christ appeared to him and said, Thomas, thou hast written well of me. And he put down his pen. What dost thou ask of me to give thee in reward? He responded with one word, thyself. In the great Summa Theologica, St. Thomas Aquinas tells us all the truths of the faith, and he summarizes them, puts them in a few words. But it's not just a matter of words. He began his life with the Hail Mary, and he ate it. He ended his life with only one word. What do you want? Christ. Beatific vision, the possession of God. And we must remember that our faith must be living. One of the great tragedies of the end of the Thomistic period in the 1400s, right just before the Renaissance in the 1500s, the late Thomists, they got so involved in distinctions, so involved in, is this right or that right, and this distinction, and that distinction, and this distinction, and that distinction, because St. Thomas was great at making distinctions. And he made many distinctions. And he said, this is great, and that's great, and this is, great. this is the right way to divide things, another way to divide things, consider the, 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 the positives, the negatives, and so on and so forth. He considered many things, many distinctions. But they made so many distinctions, by the time they finished cutting out the distinctions, there was nothing left of the truth, and it became cold, and it became dead. Our faith is life. Who is it that we believe in? Who is it that we adore? The way, the truth, and the life. He's not only truth, he's the way. We must travel along this road of the truth. He is not only uh, the road that we travel on, the decisions that we make, he is life. The truth is every part of my, in every part of my being. When I was ordained a priest, we were ordained priests, the hands are placed on top of the head. But what, what is anointed? What is sanctified? The entire being. All the way to the fingertips. All the way to the toenails. The entire being is sanctified. The entire being is filled with Christ. And we must be filled with Christ not only in our heads. We have to be filled with Christ in our hearts, filled with Christ in our passions, filled with Christ in our spirit, filled with Christ in our body, and we have to carry Christ upon our feet. The sacred scripture says, blessed are the feet of the carriers of the gospel of peace. We've got to carry Christ on our feet to every place that we go. And remember also, St. Thomas, the truth was in his whole being. He wanted to join the order of preachers. They were beggars. They were mendicants. They went walking around. They were despised in the church when he decided to enter them. A brand new order founded by St. Dominic only when St. Thomas was a little baby. He wanted to join them. And they said, no, you must join a famous order like Cluny. You must join the Benedictines. Or stay in the world, but don't join the order of preachers. And they tried to stop him, and his own relatives captured him, and they locked him up in a castle. And he introduced a prostitute into his room. <clears throat> and what did he do? He rose up with a firebrand. He was the most gentle of all men, never known to anger or violence ever in his life. 
He rose up with a firebrand. He pulled out of the fireplace. He attacked her, and she had to run for her life. He then took the cross. He took the firebrand, and he made the sign of the cross upon the door, and burned it into the door. And then angels came. And angels came and gave him a perfect purity so that he would never experience even the smallest temptation from that moment until the moment that he died. He had the purity of the angels. And then what happened? He became stronger. A little bit later, they decided, all right, we'll send his sisters. And the sisters will come and they'll tell him, you don't become a, you don't become a, a preacher of Christ. You don't become a, a teacher of Christ. They were, the devil was terrified of this young man because he had a deep understanding of the faith deeper than even the other great saints. But in such a way that he could communicate it to the whole church. In such a way that he had not only communicated the truth, but the whole, the whole spirit of the faith and the whole spirit of charity that goes with the truth. With St. Thomas, the truth is always combined with simplicity, clarity, and charity. The devil was terrified him at a young age. And the sisters came to, to, to dissuade him. And they argued with him. And they were completely worldly. They were completely living wicked lives. And at the end of the argument, what happened? They left the world. They gave away. They went away from the life of sin. They left the world. They came to Christ. He converted them. He then went to learn under St. Albert the Great. Albert, who also learned from the Blessed Virgin Mary, because Albert had a hard time to learn. He had a hard time with his studies, and his little boy, he jumped over the wall and tried to escape. And the Blessed Virgin Mary said, Albert, where are you going? He says, I don't like studying. I can't learn. Go back, and I will make you learn. The Blessed Virgin Mary, we call her the Mediatrix of all grace. But she's not only the Mediatrix of all grace, she is the mediatrix of all truth, because truth is a grace. We want to hold the truth against the modernists. We want to hold the truth against the errors and evils of the modern world. Go to St. Thomas Aquinas, because he didn't just teach us the simple truth and the clear truth, but there's grace in every word that he wrote, especially in the Summa Theologica. Great clarity and great grace, and great spirit of faith and great charity. This has to be in our teaching when we study the doctrines of the church, we must remember what their purpose is. The doctrines of the church are to save souls. The doctrine of the church is to cure the ills that original sin and actual sin put into this world. The grace of, of the truth heals. What do we call a doctor? A doctor is one who heals wounds, but the word doctor means teacher, and the main way that a doctor heals wounds is he teaches you. Don't eat poison. Don't eat too much uh, sugar. Uh, make sure you do certain exercises. Uh, stay away from these type of foods, uh, you know, uh, etc. Et Don't breathe in carbon dioxide. He tells you different things you're supposed to do and supposed to not do. He teaches. And when the doctor teaches, health comes. He's not just teaching so that we can learn interesting things. He's teaching so that we can be healthy, teaching so that we can stay alive. And a priest is a doctor. The bishop is a doctor. The church as doctors. And the greatest of the doctors of the church is St. Thomas Aquinas. He teaches. Well, what does he teach? To save souls. And one of the great troubles of the great heretics of the last 2,000 years they always turn to a kind of coldness. And they always go to some particular point of the, of, the, of the scripture or some particular point of doctrine and they tear it apart and they twist it. And who is the answer? St. Thomas Aquinas. The popes have told us the answer to every heresy is St. Thomas Aquinas. You want to understand the modern world? Understand St. Thomas Aquinas. What does St. Pius X say in Pascendi against the sum of all errors? the grand collection of all errors, the great sewer of all errors, which is called modernism. You want to defeat modernism? Sacred scripture, St. Thomas Aquinas. And when, they, when, when the, the, the doctors of the, when the, of the councils, they would put the Sesuma Theologica on the altar. We are going to teach, the church teaches what St. Thomas teaches. The church teaches the spirit of St. Thomas, the teaching of St. Thomas, and every single pope 
From the time of St. Thomas' death until, the, until Vatican II, every single one of them, St. Thomas, St. Thomas, St. Thomas, he is the common doctor of our Holy Church, and not just because of his teaching, but because of the spirit of his teaching that vivifieth, that giveth life. St. Thomas told his, his, uh, one of his, uh, his, his uh, servants, or one of his uh, disciples, he said, where does your strength come from? Where does your wisdom come from? It comes from prayer, purity, and fasting. It comes from the Blessed Sacrament. Whenever there was a great difficulty, St. Thomas always prayed. He went in front of the Blessed Sacrament. When there was a difficult passage of Scripture, he not only prayed, but he also fasted. And he said, divine inspiration came into me. He received inspiration from God, so much so that God, our Lord Jesus Christ, appeared to him just before he died, and shortened a few months before he died. Thomas, thou hast written well of me. What dost thou ask of me? Thyself. And therefore, shortly after he made that request, God gave himself in the beatific vision to Thomas Aquinas. He was still under 50 years old when he died, 25 years old when he began to teach. And in that brief period of time, he wrote volumes of, of works. And his greatest, the Summa Theologica. He disputed against heresies and defended, handled every single heresy and error of all time. How did he do it? By teaching Christ. By teaching the truth of Christ and teaching what is the way to the sacraments. In a recent study of the sacraments, for instance, we do our little opuscolas, little short studies that we do in various parts of the, of the, of the, of the, of the Summa and, and the teaching of the, the theology, what does he say about the, the, the sacraments, the form of the sacraments? The form of the sacraments are determined by Christ. He gives determinate words. He gives the answer. Can you add or subtract words? Yes, you can add or subtract words, so as long as the meaning is clapped. He gives the answer. What if, a, what if a priest mispronounces the words and says patrias et filias instead of patri et, patri et nomine patris et filii et spiritus sancti when he's doing a baptism? Suppose he mispronounces patrias et filias. Patrias et filias means the fatherland's daughters. That's not a right way to say baptism words. But St. Thomas says it is clear that the priest, when he says patrias filias, even though it says fatherland's daughters, he means to say, the Father and the Son. And we take the word according to accommodation. So that we see that what he means to say is patriot, patriot filii, Father and Son. We know he means to say that. He mispronounced. God hears his word, and we know his word. And a reasonable man, if he heard that he mispronounced, he knows exactly what he said. And therefore, it is said. But what about the modern Jansenists? The modern, the mo the modern Protestants? Those are the modern spirit of Jansen. We find it amongst the state of Icandus, unfortunately. What do they say? Well, he didn't, if the word is slightly different, if you can take it in a wrong meaning, it must be wrong. St. Thomas says, no. Follow the faith with charity. Follow the faith with the spirit of Christ. Christ is not condemned so easily. Patrias et filias is valid. We must take it according to the accommodated sense, says St. Thomas, right there in the question 60, article 7 of the Tertia Paris. And each time he speaks about the truth, he says, this is the teaching of Christ. This is how we approach the gospel. This is how we approach the faith. This is how we approach the various how moral, uh, problems of moral theology. Here's how we approach marriage. Here's how we approach baptism. Here's how we approach converts. Here's how we deal with the teachings of our church. Remember, the church teaches and gives life. It is not just cold doctrine. And remember also, he began with the angelic salutation. He ended with the beatific vision. He was in the middle, filled with the great, sac great virtue of purity, and then the, and, and on the communication with the angels. And then he, he had this the being in front of the blessed sacrament. Remember, in order for us to fight against the errors and heresies of the modern world, we must everyone have a summa. We must always have a summa. Saint Thomas always is the clearest explanation. Uh, we find time and time again. Read John of St. Thomas. He is famous. John of St. Thomas is very famous. He's a famous uh, commentator in St. Thomas Aquinas. He said, when you read John of St. Thomas, in order to understand him, you've got to go back to St. Thomas. Because his, his explanation is so complicated that you don't know what he's talking about. So you've got to go back to St. Thomas. Oh, yeah. That's what he means. Normally, the commentary is supposed to explain the original 
But in this case here, we always got to go back to the original. The same is true also in our present battle against modernism. Who explains best why evolution and Charles Darwin is an idiot? Guess who? St. Thomas Aquinas. Who explains best why the French Revolution is filled with lies and heresy and wickedness? St. Thomas Aquinas. Who explains best about the sacraments and, and that the, what's the matter and form of the sacrament and what's the intention of the sacrament? St. Thomas Aquinas. Who explains best every single teaching of the church against the Arians, against the modern Arians? What do we mean when the, by, the, by the Blessed Trinity? What is the teaching of the Blessed Trinity? What is the teaching of the various teachings about Christ concerning that? What about the De Deo Uno? What about every single teaching of our Holy Church? Every single one. What about the angels? What about the sacred scripture? What about divine inspiration? Who gives the answer? St. Thomas Aquinas, St. Thomas Aquinas, St. Thomas Aquinas. With clarity and simplicity, without any fooling around of any kind, and when we get to the commentators, some commentators get so complicated that we have to go back to St. Thomas Aquinas and back to St. Thomas Aquinas. And what do the popes do? St. Thomas Aquinas. He is the answer to the heresies of 2019. He'll be the answer to the heresies of 100 years from now and 200 years from now if God allows the world to last that long. He's the answer to the heresies all the way back. And he gives us the true holy faith with charity, with clarity, with the Blessed Virgin Mary, with the Blessed Sacrament. <coughs> and it has life when we don't just study His Word, and we don't just read His Word, and we don't just believe His Word as an intellectual thing. The faith of St. Thomas is the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, and it must enter our hearts. And we must remember, as St. Thomas did, intelligence is not enough to defeat heresy. Giving smart answers don't defeat lies. What defeats heresy? What defeats lies? Faith, faith, faith. So the St. Thomas will tell us what is more certain. Is it more certain that we are standing in this little bitty room or we're inside of this little chapel? Is that more certain? Or is it more certain that Jesus Christ is true God and true man? It is more certain that he is true God and true man. Because that's the certitude of faith. When God speaks, it cannot be wrong. When I speak, it can be a mistake. When I see, it can be a mistake. Even though I'm certain morally that what I'm saying is right. But it can be a mistake. But when Christ speaks, it cannot be a mistake. And Christ said that he is true God and true man. Therefore, I can make no mistake when I repeat that word of Christ. And I can make no mistake whatsoever in repeating his words and repeating his teaching and expressing his faith. Faith gives the greatest certitude because God is the source of all certitude. And therefore, what is going to be our certitude in this fight against modernism, in the fight against the, 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 the errors and heresies of the modern world, as it continues to get worse and worse, as the church continues to corrupt more and more? as souls more and more wander away from the faith, as they're finding more and more heresies and more and more errors and more and more lies, go back to St. Thomas. And notice St. Thomas's approach. He does not approach things from the perspective of, here are the Ten Commandments, and here are all the bad things you can do, and here's why they're wrong. No. He approaches things to the correct perspective. In the beginning there is God. God. Therefore, let us consider the one God. In the prima parts. And God is three persons in one God. So let's consider the three persons in one God, De Deo Trino. And that God created us, De Deo Creatore. And that Creator, He made the world in six days. And their first three days were the work of distinction, and the second three days were the work of adornment. And this would also match our spiritual life. And then He rested from His work on the seventh day. And then God created the angels, and God created man. And he created man for beatitude in the, pre, in the prima secundae, the first part of the second. He created man for beatitude, for happiness. We were made for happiness. And where is this happiness found? In God. And that is why he knew the right word to say when our Lord Jesus Christ said, Thomas, you have written well of me, and I want to give you a great reward. What is thy reward? What do you want? One word. Thyself. Because God is the reason for my existence. 
Why do I get up in the morning? Why do I go to bed at night? Why do I work? Why do I pray? Why do I play? Why do I sleep? Why do I speak? Why do I do everything I do? To get to the object of my happiness, and He is God. What else do I want? Nothing else. And so beatitude, we're after God. How do you get to God? By doing moral acts. But here God gave us the power to give two different kinds of moral acts, as St. Thomas. Moral acts are acts that come from the free will and intellect. There's good moral acts, but there's also bad moral acts. Good moral acts we call virtues. Bad moral acts we call vices. Let's stay away from the bad moral acts and let's do the good moral acts called virtues. And then the whole secundus secundae. These are the virtues. Here's how you get to God. Begin with the first virtue, faith. And here are the virtues that are parts of faith. And then hope. And here are the virtues that are parts of hope. And then charity. The beautiful virtue of charity. But then we have to take that faith, hope, and charity, and we've got to practice it towards our neighbor. Hence, prudence and justice. And then fortitude and temperance. And here are the states of life, particular ways of giving glory to God. You can give glory to God in the state of the religious life, as a priest. You give glory to God also by perfect duties that God gave you, such as prophet, the power of prophecy and preaching and the various, the various gifts that God mentions that we must have. And he gives a certain people to help the all souls. And then, how do we do these things successfully? How do we do these things successfully? How do we practice virtue? How do we do it? By imitating Christ. And we arrive at the Tertia of Pars. And there is, there is a third part of the Summa, Christ. He came down on this earth to show us how to go to, be, to beatitude. And there's Christ. Christ is the answer. And we go through all the life of Christ. And how did Christ, did Christ abandon us? No. When Christ went up into heaven, he left his priests in the church. He left them to give us his teaching so they would remain to the end of time. And he left us his most holy sacraments. And then it's a treatise on the sacraments, finishing out the Tertia Pars and the Supplement, which was finished after St. Thomas died, but his work. And then consider the four last things, De Nobisimis, death and judgment and heaven and hell. And all things are covered there. And when we consider all the truths, and that's the whole of the Summa, we consider all the truths, what do we find? There are various lies, there are various sins, there are various ways to go against it, and everything is covered. By looking at Christ, we know the answer to Antichrist. By looking at truth, we know the answer to lies. By looking at goodness, we know the answer to evil. <clears throat> By living with love, we know how to destroy hate. And so St. Thomas gives us the example, and he was filled with purity, filled with charity, filled with the Blessed Virgin Mary. The grace of her was always inside of him, and filled with Christ. And he didn't just teach the truth. And in our time of crisis, we have to be filled with St. Thomas. He's the answer. We've got to be filled with St. Thomas. So let's be filled with St. Thomas and live our holy faith, make him the centerpiece of our seminary, the centerpiece of our lives. And, and that, so it's a great feast day this day, this March the 7th, the Feast of St. Thomas. And, that, and so make sure that we persevere in the holy faith and keep that faith and fight against all the errors of modernism, all the errors, whatever new errors Satan wants to come up with next, the errors have, have all come from hell. Every false doctrine, every false religion comes from hell. We reject them all, but it's not enough to reject them all. We want to be filled with Christ, filled with his faith, filled with his hope, filled with his charity, and, and follow him and his holy mother to the kingdom of heaven. Blessed God bless you all, and the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.